please give a warm welcome to Ed Schwartz Show. Thank you, Mark. It's good to see everybody here. Uh, and I just, I, I want to start by just commending the New York State Writers Institute on another book festival. I hope many of you were here over the weekend. It's just, from what I've heard, it was yet another incredible success, and it's amazing to me that just a few days after that, we're already back uh, at work, and, and Jen and Mark and the whole Institute team had another event for you. It's just incredible what the Institute does for the, uh, the capital region. Uh, so yeah, just a, just a few days after the Herculean task of organizing and hosting the Albany Book Festival, uh, here we are with another fantastic writer at the University at Albany campus. Uh, as you can see, uh, Andrea Barrett is here with us today. Most of you know that she has uh, won numerous awards and grants over the years, just about every award and grant that anybody would ever, ever want to win. Uh, a MacArthur Genius Grant, a Guggenheim Fellowship, an NEA Fellowship, uh, the Rea Award for the Short Story, uh, the National Book Award for Ship Fever. Uh, in addition, you know, there, there have been many other books uh, before and after Ship Fever. Uh, Voyage of the Narwhal, Servants of the Map, uh, The Air We Breathe, and more. Uh, and she's here today. I, I noted we, we had a, a session here in the uh, afternoon, and I noted a few of these things earlier. But she's here today not far from her alma mater, uh, which maybe some of you know. It's uh, Union College. Uh, I don't know what the mascot is at Union College, uh, but go or whatever that Union College <laughs> mascot is. Uh, and uh, she's here with us today to celebrate her 10th uh, her tenth, tenth work of fiction. So, uh, and that's a story collection called Natural History. I would hold my copy up, but it's right over there. Uh, but you'll have opportunities to see what the book looks like. And there are books for sale uh, out there. Not only, not only is the book house here representing with the books, but the owner of the book house is the one selling the books tonight. So you know it's a special occasion when the owner of the bookstore comes to the event. Uh, that's Susan Novotny out there. Uh, Natural History has already been hailed as quote, more, more superb work from an American master. And the, uh, the Wall Street Journal, in a recent rave review, kind of did uh, what I've been calling a, uh, almost like a Hollywood-style elevator pitch for Andrea Barrett and her work. Uh, they, they sort of, in, in this rave review, they described uh, the work in this way, quote, Darwin, master of large collections of facts, meets Chekhov, subtle manager of multiple viewpoints. Okay. I mean, you'd, you'd go see that movie, right? Uh, I mean, we, people would line up. Uh, it's also, the Natural History has also been named uh, one of the most anticipated books uh, of 2022, and once you read it, you'll see why. Uh, it's an incredible collection, and we're so, we're so fortunate uh, to have Andrea Barrett here with us tonight. We had a great session this afternoon with, with some of the students from uh, English 350 who had been uh, fortunate enough to read the book prior to its publication, and everybody really enjoyed getting to ask questions uh, this afternoon, and, and we'll have that opportunity tonight as well. Uh, I think I think what we'll do in terms of the way the event will go is uh, Andrea will read for a little bit, and and then we'll uh, have a conversation. I'll I'll kick it off with a couple questions, but I'll really aim. We're we're a nice intimate group here tonight, uh, so I'll aim to make it a a group conversation, not just a, uh, I mean, it's great to talk to Andrea, I could do it for a long time, uh, but I would love to have you uh, join us in our conversation. All right, so please join me in welcoming Andrea Barrett back to you all. Thank you, Mark. It's alive, that mic is Okay, I'm trying not to swear, which is a problem for me. <laughs> Does that sound okay to everybody? Great. Um, I am really thrilled to be back here. I was here uh, quite some years ago for a book called The Air We Breathe, which is set up in the Adirondacks, which is where I live now by great good fortune. Um, I moved up there full time about three years ago, and I really love it there. So um, some of these stories were written up there. Um, Natural History, the book I'm reading from, is a set of linked stories. They're linked to each other, 
But they're also linked to the five books before that. There's overlapping characters, um, people from families that go as far back as ship fever and run through the voyage of the narwhal and servants of the map and the air we breathe. Um, but you don't need to know any of those people to know this book or to get what's going on in the book. But if you happen to have read any of those books and you happen to be interested in the weird things I'm interested in, there's a big family chart at the end <laughs> where everybody is related to everybody else and you can see how it all fits together. Um, in this book, the town um, where the protagonist, Henrietta Atkins, um, grows up and lives is called Crooked Lake. Um, those of you who are from New York State will also recognize it um, as a very lightly fictionalized fictionalized uh, Hammond's Port at the tip of Keuka Lake in central New York. Um, when I first started writing stories set there, I just called it Hammond's Port, but then I kept making up a town that was less and less like Hammond's Port and more like someplace else, so now it's called Crooked Lake. Um, Henrietta uh, Atkins, who's at the heart of most of these stories, uh, is a high school teacher and an amateur naturalist for most of her life. Um, she's single. You could argue that nothing much exciting happens in her life, and yet to her, her life is very exciting, the way our own lives are very exciting to all of us. Um, the last part of the book is a story about a woman who's related to her that also links back to Henrietta, so you'll see what's going on there when you get there. Um, I'm going to read, I think, tonight the opening pages of a story called Henrietta and Her Moths, and I'll stop after about a third of it, and you'll just have to read the book to find out what happens. So this is the beginning of Henrietta and Her Moths. For a club gathering late in the spring, Henrietta chose rosy maple moss, which Marion loved. A moss like a flower, a moss like a doll, the body furred in soft yellow, legs and feathered antennae bright pink, dark eyes shiny above pink and yellow wings. She had some pupae just ready to open and the afternoon's program planned before discovering she'd have with her not only Marion, but also her two other nieces. A lane she could cradle tightly wrapped in the crook of her left arm, freeing her right arm to handle specimens and write. Marion could sit at the work table with the four young lepidopterists currently in the club, but Carolyn, how hard it was to keep track of her. She sat at the table, knocked a jar over, jumped up and rummaged through the bookshelves, sat again and watched Sadie wield a small brush, accidentally crushed a chrysalis, burst into tears. She was five, Henrietta reminded herself as she jiggled Elaine. Still five, a little girl and was consoled only when Henrietta pulled out a special low chair she favored and set a screen partway around it, making Carolyn a private corner. If you could help me, Car Henrietta said, I want to put you in charge of your sister. You, she said firmly, depositing Elaine into the same calico-lined wooden box where Marion had once napped. No one else. It's a lot of responsibility, but I can do it, Carolyn said, leaning protectively over the box. Just me. When Henrietta was small, she'd loved the small square building behind the house, the workshop where her father dreamed up mechanical devices and built the patent models he sent off to Washington. A trickle of income from his most successful inventions still, years after his death, kept the family afloat. A few years after Henrietta started teaching at the high school, she decided that she'd work there just as he had. What could be more natural? When she cleared it out, polished the windows, and repainted the floor, it didn't need much else. A coal stove, a sink, some shelves. She paid a handyman to install those. Then, delighted with the result, she moved in most of her specimens. Lovely, said her mother who often complained of the clutter in the house. Perfect, she said, when Henrietta further transformed the building into an insect nursery. Although really, Henrietta thought, her mother had to defend it. Otherwise, she might have seemed to be criticizing her daughter. The neighbors called it the caterpillar room 
and while a few were charmed, others stopped crossing the backyard, and Mrs. Weatherwax avoided the house entirely. Let them fuss, said Henrietta's mother calmly. She showed curious visitors how the marvels inside were arranged. Caterpillars, chrysalides, cocoons, and eggs, breeding cages and glass jars filled with green branches, winged adults drinking from sugar water sprinkled moss, and everything neatly labeled. White-lined morning sphinx, hog caterpillar of the grapevine, royal, royal walnut moth. At first, Henrietta kept those creatures in plain glass tumblers, as she'd learned from a book that her friend Daphne gave her. Put your caterpillar upon a white paper, which you have first placed on an old book or other firm substance, and cover him with the glass. If you have several kinds at once, it is well to label the glasses. Write grape or apple or poplar upon a slip of paper and paste it upon the tumbler which covers that caterpillar you found upon the grape, apple, or other leaf. This will avoid confusion as one by one they go into chrysalids. You can study each one separately and you will know as they come out of those which you have seen them make just which is the moth of the grape, apple, or whatever your label indicates. You will thus know also at a moment's glass, glance how to feed them. They know what they want, which is more than can be said of some people. Henrietta, who in those days knew exactly what she wanted, quickly found this too simplistic, but she retained the obvious ideas, which she'd used in other areas, of labeling everything and keeping track of the caterpillar's food plants. Soon she corralled her friend Mason Perrot into helping her build breeding cages, a foot square and 18 inches tall, along the walls. Mason cut the glass and the wood, tucked the wire screening over the tops, sifted the dirt for the bases, and cleaned out jars to hold the leafy branches. He made a display stand to entice the first members of Henrietta's Young Lepidopterist Club, and later built smaller cases for her classroom. He left to Henrietta the preparation of the killing jars and the pinning of the specimens, but he kept good notes and his neat handwriting appeared on some of the labels. Until 1885, the year she shed Mason like an outgrown skin, he was an excellent helper. The years immediately following Mason's departure were surprisingly calm, despite the unpleasant way in which they parted. Surprisingly happy. Hester startled Henrietta by marrying Ambrose Cummings, who owned a shoe and boot store in the village, and was so quiet that Henrietta had hardly noticed him. At first, things didn't change too much. They moved into a modest white house with red steps, a wide porch, a view of the pleasant valley through a frame of sturdy lilacs and trellised roses. Henrietta particularly liked that her sister's new place was barely a mile from their family home and an easy walk from the high school. She was helping out with a new kitchen cupboard one day, a few months after the wedding, when Hester announced that she was pregnant. Ambrose hammered four nails in the wrong place while talking giddily about their hopes for several sons. Surreptitiously, Henrietta inspected her sister's waist, but Hester had always been nicely plump, with rounded forearms and calves and a smooth, short neck, and she looked no different. The changes came after she lost that baby, and then, several years later, another. Exactly what Henrietta had dreaded. Their own mother had lost several between herself and Hester. Hester's hair thinned and her feet swelled, but the doctor couldn't figure out what was wrong, and Henrietta feared she might, feared she might be developing heart problems, like those that now confined their mother to the house. Perhaps, Henrietta suggested, Hester should avoid having children. But Hester said Henrietta understood nothing, not about marriage, not about motherhood. You're 36, Hester pointed out then, without even a prospect. And what was Henrietta supposed to say to that? 
Although she'd never told Hester about the painter Sebi Quinn, her only regret about giving up Mason was the wreck of their long friendship and the gossip that it caused. Hester should have understood how limited her choices had otherwise been. Only men crippled in one way or another had returned from the war. And if Daphne had continued all this time with only the occasional gentleman friend, never settling into marriage, why shouldn't she? These days, when acquaintances nudged her toward plausible mates, she talked about her work, and if they pressed further, pointed out her obligations to her students and her family. Not just all her mother needed, but her deep involvement in her sister's life. Which she could not, of course, say to her sister. Instead, as a way of counteracting Hester's growing despair and aimlessness, Henrietta begged her for help in the caterpillar room. I need another pair of hands, she said truthfully. You'd be doing me a favor. To her delight, Hester, who hadn't been interested in the caterpillars when she was a girl, she liked to sew, she liked to cook, she was a wizard gardener, agreed. Ambrose, who since Hester's second miscarriage had been devoting his spare time to raising and rebuilding a steamship sunk at the village dock, encouraged her in this. You're always finding caterpillars outside, he said, even when no one else notices them. Mostly, he seemed relieved she might have something to do that didn't involve him. One late July afternoon during Hester's first year helping out, <coughs> Henrietta led her into the vegetable patch behind the house where their mother had once taught them to pick hornworms off the tomato leaves and toss them into the chicken coop. Now they gathered a dozen smaller hornworms, about an inch long, through their third mold, Henrietta explained, but not yet their fourth, so the, lung lepid the young lepidopterists would still have plenty to see. She'd been telling them how an adult might lay eggs, a larva might be induced to pupate, how a chrysalis treated kindly might in some months open to reveal a moth who might lay eggs. They might work out a creature's life history by starting anywhere. Six little tin boxes for her six students, two caterpillars and a handful of fresh tomato leaves in each box. Hester helped with that. A few days later, the youngsters watched the caterpillars squirm and flex until the old skin burst behind the head and the face covering pushed forward by the new, larger head hung like a horse's feed bag. As the new caterpillars crawled from their old skins, the youngsters noted the date and the time each broke free. Length two inches, Eleanor wrote. Pale green head with white dots. Buff spiracles circled with black, Sharp, long horn in the back, body bright green with yellow V-shaped markings. Very hungry. Mandy, shielding her neck as if the caterpillar might leap up and bite her, said uneasily that they ate as if they'd never stopped. The leaves in the boxes melted away, transformed into green flesh. Soon the caterpillars were as long and thick as Henrietta's own substantial forefingers and so strong that when Amy forgot to put the square of scrim Hester had given her over the tin box and under the lid, her caterpillars stood up on their hind pro legs and, were they squeaking, pushed the lid off the box. Thomasina quit the club after those heavy green heads poked out, but the others stalwartly added dirt to their boxes and watched the caterpillars burrow into it to emerge two weeks later as pulpy green pupae that hardened over a few hours into shapes they'd seen in their own gardens but not always recognized. Orestes marveled at the way the tube of the tongue case moved blindly through the air until the tip touched the wing covers and the whole structure solidified into a firm brown object, as shiny as a chestnut, with handsome curved segments and the tube containing the tongue arched back like the handle of a jug. Later, after school started up, Henrietta showed those who continued in the club the five spotted sphinx moths hatch hatching out. 
The students sketch the black and circled orange spots ornamenting each side of the torso and the soft gray back of the head. Mandy rendered the velvety eyes, but it was Hester joining the youngsters who captured the five inch tongue unrolling and being shaken and then smoothed like a lock of hair before recurling into a little wheel. Later, after they released the moss, they found one making a sound like a tiny drill as it drank from a stand of evening primroses. That's not a hummingbird, Hester said, leaning in. Hummingbird moth, Henrietta said. Watch. Four inches from the next flower, the creature hovered, not dipping a long beacon for the nectar, but instead unfurling that marvelous tongue. Hester was so pleased by this that she volunteered to help once more in the spring of 1892, although she was pregnant again. I'm going to stop there and let you figure the rest out later. Thank you. Uh, listening to that, I mean, I just, I, I love that story. I love the book. I love Henrietta. Uh, and listening to you read, it, it made me think maybe we should talk about Henrietta a little bit. I mean, especially in the, in the context of a word that hearing you, I mean, I, I was aware of this word reading the book, but hearing you read that section, I realized the word help kept coming up again and again. I mean, all these people talking about helping. Uh, and I was wondering how we could talk about the, the role of being a helper, of what it means to help, and also the kind of character that Henrietta is in the, in the sort of universe of your fiction. Um, thanks, that's such a great question. Um, it wasn't until I had written a bunch of the stories that I realized how much of Henrietta's life is shaped by her need to help others and by that um, conflict all of us feel, but um, I'm prejudiced now and I'm going to apologize for this in advance, but I, I always still feel like women are more prone to be in this helping role than men and that, um, that we have slightly more of that felt conflict in our lives between our own ambitions and desires and our need to take care of everybody around us. And, um, and that's a big part of who Henrietta is for me. Um, she's a teacher, so that's helping by nature, but she's also someone who's deeply involved in her um, her mother's life, her sister's life, and then um, she will end up having five nieces, although she has three in this story, and she's very much responsible for taking care of them. So, um, as we all do, and certainly as all women do, yeah, she's all the time juggling those competing needs. So, her life in the 1880s or 1890s might not be so familiar to us now, um, her life in the caterpillar room probably isn't at all familiar to most of us now, but I think we all still feel that um, constant tug and pull between wanting to follow our own passions and our own interests and trying to take care of our, res our human beings that are around us and our responsibilities to them. Yeah. yeah I mean, the, the, that story, I mean, it mentions Mason. Uh, you know, the, the people who haven't read the whole book don't, don't necessarily know who Mason is, but. I think it's enough to say that Mason represents the kind of possibility of the more familiar or so a, a sort of a romantic uh, kind of possibility or this idea that will Henrietta find a family of her own? And, and that, that, that was a question too that students had after reading Wonders of the Shore uh, and thinking about Henrietta. And, and I wonder if you could talk about that too in terms of Henrietta as a character and what what her what her boundaries are, what her limits are, what what limits are built into her life, and what does which limits does she create? I, I think she ends up um, creating a lot of boundaries, but I don't think she's aware of herself doing that for quite a long time. Um, the fellow mentioned here, Mason Perot, is a totally nice guy. He's what in my mother's day was called good husband material. <laughs> you know, he's smart, he's solid, he loves her. He's interested in the same thing she's interested in. He lives in the same town. He could have made her a nice house and given her her own children. It's like, so why doesn't she marry him? He's a good helper. He's a good helper. <laughs> he builds the, the boxes for the caterpillars. Um, and she does really like him and have feelings for him. But um, again and again, when the possibility of her um, joining her life to one man or another and having a more conventional life presents itself to her, something in her turns away from that. Um, 
I'm not sure she understands what that is, but I know that she feels that she's made the right choice each time in turning away. And I think the kind of work she did and the kind of relationship she has with her students maybe wouldn't have been possible. Um, it's interesting, I was listening to your question, the phrase you use is a phrase I use too, and we all use, you said, a family of her own. And we all say that as if a family of our own only includes the children we make ourselves with our own bodies, but families come in many shapes and sizes and ways, and she does have a family. She has a family by blood, and she has a family by affinity and attachment and teaching, and um, for her that's the right kind of family, and that makes sense to her. Yeah, I mean, she has her own, uh, you could say, she has her own family tree, yeah. like right at, the, right at the back of the book. Uh, so it's certainly, certainly family. Uh, can you say how you, how Henrietta kind of took over the book? Or how did you know that this was in many ways Henrietta's book? Was that immediately apparent or? Oh, it wasn't immediately apparent, but after I wrote Wonders of the Shore, um, I knew I, I wanted to write more about her. And so I just sort of edged into another story and then once I had three stories about her, there's actually two stories about Henrietta in my last book, which is called The Archangel. There's one when she's quite a young woman, it's called The Island. And there's a one where she's a kind of secondary character, is a very old woman helping a young boy who comes to, to Crooked Lake. Um, and I realized that I really wanted to cover all the stages of her life. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to find a way to write about her when uh, having children of her own was still possible, when she made each of those decisions, and what her life was like as it played out. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's a great character. For those of you who haven't read the book yet, you have a real treat in store. Uh, do, do we have questions? I mean, we can, we can, we can take questions about uh, writing, craft, uh, books that aren't brand new, uh, books you read previously. Anything along those lines, and I'm happy to keep asking questions, but here we all are. Yeah, ask me whatever you want. There's nothing I won't answer. So, <laughs> yeah. You know so much about the uh, lepidoptery. Oh, so little, really. So. <laughs> uh, I, I just wonder how much of that you had done yourself. Um, almost none of it. You know, I'm a, it's like I'm an armchair lepidopterist, the same way I'm an arm, armchair traveler. Um, you know, I look at butterflies and moths and hummingbird moths and caterpillars the same way we all do while I'm out walking around, but um, do I have a caterpillar box in a caterpillar room? I do not. Um, <laughs> I, but what I do have is a shelf full of books about butterflies and moths written by what were then called lady naturalists in the 1850s and 60s and 70s and 80s. They're beautiful books. Um, there are, there's a lot of insect books written by women in the late 19th century because, you know, butterflies are somehow conceived of as feminine. Butterflies are dainty. Butterflies are like they have pretty colors. Somehow, if you're wearing a long skirt and um, you're often in your living room, it's okay, I guess, to look at butterflies in a way that it's not okay to like, go out and stab a pig and see what the intestines look like. So it was sort of an acceptable practice. And the books are beautiful. Often the women who wrote them um, also painted the illustrations. And very painstakingly, all the stages um, from the egg all the way through the different development. And um, not surprisingly either, a lot of people are interested in metamorphosis in general. And I'm interested, of course, in metamorphosis as a writer, the way that we move through the stages of our lives and we keep um, assuming new forms and shedding old skins and remaking ourselves. Um, and I think Henrietta is really interested in that too. She won't confront that directly. but. Um, anyone who's ever watched a butterfly emerge has been fascinated by that. And also, how many of you have had the experience, maybe when you were a child, of poking at a chrysalis to see if there was a baby butterfly? And then, you know, you poke and there's nothing in it but this, it's like no snot. It's just like, yuck. <laughs> um, there's no baby butterfly in there. And there's no caterpillar in there. There's just like, yuck. And then that brings up all those questions. How does it get made? How do we 
evolve? How does nature work? I mean, that's how biologists come to be biologists. You have that experience of finding something totally mystifying and wanting to answer questions. And um, that's sort of at the essence of Henrietta's character, too. And sort of it's at the essence of mine as well, except I don't express it by poking to see the goo come out. I express it by looking at somebody else's pictures and posting. <laughs> I'm an abstract painter. Um. <laughs> but you were, I mean, when you were at Union College, you were a biology major. I, I mean, was. what was, uh, as a child, what was, uh, do you have, can you remember what you, what you saw that drove you to become a biology major? What out in the world captured your attention at first? Yeah, a lot of it was stuff in the ocean, because I, I grew up on Cape Cod, mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't that far from the water. And when I was quite little, we lived in the lower Cape, where the beaches, um, are very mucky. It's not where the tourists go to swim. It's not the dramatic um, beaches. It's like long, long mud flats and seas of eelgrass and just a huge intertidal zone. So there's all sorts of slimy, interesting, and creepy crawlies around. And those are the things I got to poke at. Um, stranded jellyfish and mm -hmm. all kinds of sea worms and uh, just a lot of slimy, kind of really fascinating invertebrates. That's great. Yes, please. Yes. Uh huh. When did you decide on those words? You know, I, I've known and loved that. Can you want to read them out so we can hear them, or or someone? Yeah, have it here. Okay. There were some advantages about being a writer of histories. The desk was a shelter one could hide behind. It was a hole one could creep in. Yeah. That, that comes from a, a novel of hers I particularly love. Um, and that's sort of a, um, that thought is a sort of double-edged thought. It's appended to a character who's not particularly admirable, who tends to hide from life um, as he writes his academic papers. But um, for me, that has sort of a, like a secret affinity, because I'm aware that I do that too, or I can do that, that I can seal myself off from things that are really important in my own life by just sort of tunneling down and looking at my desk and falling into my work. And there's a good part of that, which is I get my work done, and there's a very bad part of that, which means I ignore things I ought not to ignore, or um, issues in my own family or with people I love that I ought to be paying more attention to. And so I like that double blade of that, and that's why I use that. <laughs> Is Henrietta doing that? Hiding? I haven't read the book yet. <laughs> I, I don't think she is. I think Henrietta is much better than I am at, at balancing the demands, um, the real demands of work and life. I think she doesn't really hide very much. That, those are my failings, not her. <laughs> Yeah. It, it's interesting to hear you talk about doubleness in this way too. I mean, in my house, you know, I'm often accused of like dad jokes that are kind of like have puns in them, you know, uh, the lowest form of humor, I suppose. But uh, but there, it seems like there's doubleness in the in the title of the book, Natural History. There's doubleness in Wonders of the Shore. You know, if we put some pressure on shore, there's there's doubleness in the regimental history. Uh, uh, I, I wonder if that, like, where that comes into your process. I mean, w in, in Wonders of the Shore, it's about are, are these characters sure about the decisions they've made? In the regimental history, it's is there, is there the possibility for some kind of regimented history? And in natural history, it, it just begs the question, uh, what, what is, what is natural history? What's, what's unnatural history? And I, I'm, I'm just wondering how you think through titles like that and how you want them to resonate. With, with the book? Um, this is slightly humiliating, but I don't think through them at all. Okay. I just heard those for the first oh, time. Ah, see. That's, that's the dad joke in me. No, I love that. That's so great, but... Um, I thought I had a real pattern there. I mean, I, 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 I didn't just have one example. I had several examples. My, my unconscious probably does recognize <laughs> things, but I'm not consciously Fair enough. aware of them. Um, but, you know, this is one of the great things about being a writer. We make these little things, and we send them out in the world, and then smart, smart people read them. 
and they tell us all this stuff that's there. <laughs> and I'm always surprised, still, after all this time, people tell me what a story means to them or what a title or a phrase. It's like, oh my god, that's so cool. But that's what makes reading so fun and so creative, is you, you bring all your intelligence and all your experience and your life to bear on what you're reading. And so, of course, you take a whole set of stuff out of it mm -hmm. that I didn't consciously put in there. Yeah. But, so, but yay. <laughs> Fair enough. But can you talk about how you came up with the title for the, the collection? Yeah, that was conscious. It's, um, I mean, natural history, obviously. I, when I was first putting this book together, a, a dear friend of mine, he said, what are you working on? I told him, and he looked at me blind face. He said, right. 10 books and she finally gets natural history as a title. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I've only been writing about it for 30 years. So, uh, so there was that. But in this case there was also, the, the book is very explicitly concerned with how we make history and how we take stories. So there was that tension I was aware of between natural history, unnatural history, what does it mean to talk about history mm -hmm. when uh, people use the phrase uh, like the natural history of the senses or the natural history of the ocean. Yeah. They're talking about one kind of thing, but there's a million ways you can turn and twist that phrase. And I, I did like that sense, and I wanted all those meanings to, mm -hmm. to fold in. Yeah. But on the, it was also the most obvious thing <laughs> that I failed to see for six books. <laughs> Thank you. Other, other questions you might have? Yes, yeah, Susan, please. Uh, we moved in December of 2019, right before the pandemic started, very luckily for us. So we just had the past uh, few years full-time yeah. in Adirondacks. Yeah. And don't you love the Adirondacks? I do love it so much. <laughs> um, we were there part-time for five years before that, and we visited a great deal when I was young, which is how I got to know the Saranac Lake area and the, the places where the air we breathe is sent. But um, yeah, I just love it unreasonably. I, I can't really say why, but it's always felt like home to me. The, um, the place where we live now is a small house in the middle of a pretty big woods, and it's mostly conifers. And so especially on a rainy day, like it's been the last couple of days, the air just reeks of pine smell and everything smell. And I love that smell. And also, this year I have a pileated woodpecker living in my yard. It's like, are you serious? <laughs> um, I always have lots of downy woodpeckers and lots of harries and uh, you know, lots of little birds. But then the other day, this great big sort of dinosaur thing flew across the driveway. <laughs> and he went over to his nest and then he flew back. <laughs> like, really? In my yard? It's the best thing ever. I love that. So. I think most people here probably have some connection to the Adirondacks or have climbed or traveled there. Yeah, it's a great place. We're so lucky to have it in our backyard. It's just, it's so close and it's so big. There's so much of it. There's a lot of it still I haven't seen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you a, a 46er? Or? No, no, I'm a, a, like a 6er maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or a 12er or something. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do hike and, and walk a lot, but mostly smaller peaks, partly because for both good and ill, the, the high peaks area, which I'm only about 50 minutes from, has gotten so popular in the last few years, it, it's kind of not worthwhile going up the, the really big ones anymore during the season, because part of the reason I like to go to the mountains is to be alone and to be outside, and um, it's very densely peopled down in the summer. So. Yeah. Um. I mean, maybe just to go back to the book for a minute, too. Can you, can you say, this is a question I meant to ask this afternoon, but I didn't. In, in the new collection, which story was the most challenging to write? Which one really uh, was the most difficult or fought you or anything you'd like to say about that? Uh, the regimental history really just broke me. <laughs> 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 just, I just worked on it for so long. I Such a great story. Understand what it was trying to be or do. There's all these different viewpoints. It yes. takes place over so many years. I just couldn't understand it for a long time. But um, I learned a little bit about the Civil War writing it, so that was fun. <laughs> um, and also, you know, I learned something about how you can put a story in and how much time you can skip mm -hmm. in a story. And 
the possibilities for moving around among different points of view. Um, you know, just because writers have been writing for a long time, um, it's not like you ever really get much better at this. And that's one of the reasons writing is so fun, is you learn certain things and you get, you know, a kind of baseline of knowledge and, and you get a facility at certain craft things. But still, every book and every story, if you're doing it right, you're pretty much starting all, all over again. It's, you know, it's a whole new set of problems. If you're really giving yourself to it, you're just a rank beginner in the world of that story again, and you just have to fall over backwards into it and start again. It, you know, if it gets too easy, it's not usually very good anymore because you, you know, you're just doing it by rote. Um, and that's also the reason you never get bored with it because um, it's, you know, it's not like you're doing the same thing. You're doing a different thing every time. So there, there's that sense of freshness and ability to learn that as I get older and older and older, <laughs> I'm very grateful for something that um, I can still find freshness in and, and newness in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a, it's a fabulous story, and, and uh, I'm glad it didn't break you. I'm glad you, you got it back somehow. You I haven't written anything since. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> wait, <laughs> was that the last story for the no, book? No, okay. <laughs> I'll never write again. <laughs> Uh, other, other questions, other things you'd like to ask? Yes, please. <coughs> Sorry, I haven't read the book, but I was just interested to know any books, other books or writers that you use to sort of guide this environmental writing. That you um, do you mean fiction or nonfiction or both? Yeah. The idea of like environmental thing writing. Can you, can you repeat the, I didn't quite hear the question, about environmental? Environmental writing and, okay. um, yeah, um, you know, people don't label Willa Cather as an environmental writer, but she is one, I think, and, and I cherish her very much, and I read a lot of her. I think she has a way of um, sort of noticing the outside world that's quite remarkable. But I, I do read a lot of nonfiction about science and the environment, too. Um, I always enjoy Diane Ackerman, um, Davis Sobel is fabulous, um, Betsy Colbert. I think I thought The Sixth Extinction was an astonishing book. Um, so especially she really takes a dip into the deep history um, that for me was very illuminating. Um, I, do you know Jonathan Weiner? He wrote a book called The Beak of the Finch that I think is an amazing exploration of kind of in real time Darwinian evolution. Um, it, there's hardly any good science writers that I haven't flirted with a little bit. I, I think good science writing is really, really hard. Um, I often wish I both had a chance to teach it and knew enough about it to teach it, because I, I think it's something we should teach people more. It's a really complex skill, mastering science well enough to write about it in a way that um, lay people can understand, and not just understand, but be interested in. Um, I would include in that even um, things like Alexander Horwitz has a new book about, um, uh, about a, her pandemic puppy, but it's really a study of adolescence and dogs. I, I mean, you can take anything and make it interesting if you're a good enough writer. Not many people are good enough writers, but I love to read stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What do you think of when you think of as environmental writers that you like? The passage you're reading, it reminded me of um, sort of the stories in, I don't know if you've read Brady and Seagrass. Oh yeah, she's terrific. Yeah, I just read that last year. Yeah, it just, the, the, the first story you read, it just reminded me of that a lot. I love, I love that book, I love the way it's so relevant to our time, and it's just like these little like, vignettes and stories that yeah. feel so familiar. I love that. Oh, thanks for bringing that up. That's um, Robin Kimmerer, is yeah. that right? Yeah. Um, no, I, I was very late to discover her, and I thought that was just a marvelous book. So I've really been enjoying that very much. And for those of you who haven't read it, it it's great. So what are some other books that some of you like to read or have read recently that you like? Yeah. The passage you just read reminded me of the last book I read, which was Unsheltered by Barbara Kingsall. Oh, yeah. 
she's wonderful too and um, I think that was based on the life of Mary Tree um, who, who is one of these late 19th century biologists I don't know Treat's work well enough to know what changes King Solver worked on that, but um, but I sure enjoyed reading the novel. So showing a woman who was captivated by her subject. Yeah. 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 Uh, she has, I think, a new book out, but I haven't read it. So. And she herself was trained as a scientist. I've I've heard that before. I've never had the pleasure of meeting her, but I. Is that right? I think it's always exciting when we discover the weird things people can be excited about. It sort of opens up our world a little bit. Um, I love when I read something that I would have thought of as like boring or something I wouldn't be interested in and then somebody writes a great piece about it and I think why that's actually super fascinating <laughs> I'm really interested in those lichens in the backyard that are so strange to me um, yeah it's great when people do that and she's a wonderful example of that um, it's, it's those writers that help us see yeah and she times when I've been in book groups and it's, people say isn't that wonderful writing and my reaction is it's wonderful thinking Oh, bless you. <laughs> yeah. The connections that are made to bring something alive that you, know, you might not notice. I feel like that too. I think it's always a huge gift when I read something that um, somebody just sort of, it's like when you are trying to train a puppy and you sort of seize its head by the jaw and you tilt it this way and like make them look over there. It's like I'm reading something and someone goes, look there. <laughs> and then I do and then I see something um, that I just had failed to pay attention to before. It's a real pleasure when that happens. Yeah. This is somewhat connected to what you just said, but very different from the previous conversations. For yourself, you have identified some areas that you are interested in and you like to read things that you can learn from and so on. But to what degree do you have you developed the art of listening to others and really understanding what what seems to be important in you? the world around you? Um, not as much as I would have liked, of course. Uh, you know, if I really had that, I would be a Buddhist monk, right? <laughs> but, um, but that, developing that skill is very important to me. <coughs> Excuse me. And, I, you know, I try to listen. The older I get, the more I try to shut up and just listen more and pay attention to what everybody around me is saying and what's interesting to them. I think that's the most important thing we can do in our lives in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it's taken me a long time to learn to do that even partially well. So I'd like to do it better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said all become Buddhist monks. Yeah. Be, <laughs> world would be better. Uh, Mark, so I, like, so we, uh, one, one question or two yeah, more? Yeah, yeah. Why don't we take uh, one, one or two? Okay. Yes, please, and then Mike. Well, I'm wondering if you're familiar with Essex Farn and Christian Kimball and her writing about establishing the farm with her husband. Her writing is just so wonderful. It is so wonderful. Um, She's my neighbor, and I know them both. I live about five miles from the farm. Um, I have both her books, and yeah. <coughs> excuse me. I think there's. Do you yeah, want I to think she's farm chair. <coughs> you can. Is there one? Yeah, there, I was just gonna. I think there it is. <coughs> Ha <laughs> ha. 
I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. We have a sort of joke in town. We say all the good stuff from the farm goes to New York. Oh. <laughs> uh, most of my friends have shares in the farm. I belong to another CSA. Mm -hmm. um, but they do pack up stuff and send it to the city and then send it to Albany. So if the eggplant are a little denty, we say all the good ones went to New York City. <laughs> so, she's a wonderful writer. Mm -hmm. and, and Mike, you had a... We had a, uh, a book festival on Saturday. We had Judy Shepard uh, yeah. across the hall. <coughs> and uh, it was a panel on apocalyptic fiction. And someone in the audience asked a question about uh, the research that he did because he, similar to you, he, he takes a, a, a sliver of, of history and he creates these, these, these magical stories. You talked in the afternoon about how it's sort of, it, it's your process, but, but you stick to those historical facts. You're not changing the years of events or, or those sorts of things. So with, with the craft of what, of what you're writing, you, have, you mentioned you have your one screen here for your text. This here is a screen of your notes. What happens when something in the notes kind of just bugs you so much that it's not, it's not syncing up with how you want that arc to go? I change the arc. <laughs> you, you let yourself do that. No, I don't change the fact. I change the arc. I really won't go there. Jim and I are very old friends. He's the person who brought me to Williams to teach, and, um, and so we know each other and our processes quite well, and we talk <laughs> about this a lot. But um, I don't, s well, actually, Jim will change facts. We were talking this afternoon about how that is kind of a continuum, and people will go to different places along it. And I remember reading a story of his about William Beebe, the um, person who went down under the ocean in a bathosphere years ago. And I knew Beebe's work, so I knew Jim had changed something pretty significant. So we, we talked a lot about that. It was very fruitful and very interesting. But um, yeah, I won't do it. If the bathosphere sunk, then either the bathosphere sinks in my story or I write a different story. So, um, that's, I don't know why I feel that way so strongly. I just, I, can't, I literally can't do it. I can't write the sentence. I just can't do it. I guess I guess Voyage of the Narwhal would be an example, right? Where you, you, yeah. you, you made you you didn't want to use the actual expedition, so you. Well, that's why I made a fictional. You created expedition. your own. Yes. Um, when I was uh, first getting interested in Arctic expeditions and the naturalists on those expeditions, for a long time, a couple of years, I was reading all these narratives, thinking this one or this one or this one or that one, but none of them had the right story or none of them covered all the points I wanted to cover or touched on all the areas. And I couldn't make a story I wanted to tell without doing violence to one of the actual expeditions. So I ended up just making up an expedition. And um, I'm a little proud of this. This took some finesse. There's a lot of Arctic expeditions during the time when the novel's concerned. And finding a space of a couple months when I could slip an invented expedition in and not have them cross paths with an actual <laughs> expedition. Um, I don't mind saying that took some doing, but I finally found a little spot where I could like and get away with it. But you know, that's kind of crazy. It's like, why didn't I just take an actual expedition and change some stuff? Don't know. <laughs> it's, there's like things we can do and things we can't do, and I just I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. 